Chapter 4. In a split second, his mind sifted through thousands of pictures and diagrams, the nightmare images of a personal library of shark books. A nurse shark, probably, maybe a reef shark, about four feet long, puny by jaw standards. But when you come across one, the real thing, with all the fearsome features, all the weapons in the right places, it never occurred to him to try to swim away or to scramble for the surface. He just hung there, turned to stone, watching the big fish's unhurried approach. Go away, he pleaded silently. Don't come near me. He could see the teeth now, and he knew, in the absolute core of his being, that this predator was coming for him and him alone. He would never have believed himself capable of such panic. Before he knew what he was doing, the dive knife was in his hand, and he leaped at the shark, plunging the blade into the soft underside. Strong arms grabbed him from behind, but nothing could stop him now. With a vicious slash, he slit the shark's belly open from stem to stern. The creature convulsed once, jaw snapping. Then it began to sink, leaving a cloudy trail of blood. Kaz was spun around and found himself staring into the furious eyes of the masked Gerard. The guide gestured emphatically for the surface. Kaz shook his head. Couldn't he see? The danger was over. The shark was dead. English did not waste a second command. He placed an iron grip on Kaz's arms, inflated his BC, and dragged the boy to the surface. They broke the air thirty yards in stern of the Cortez. Get on the boat! Kaz was bewildered. But it's okay, I got him. The guide was in a towering rage. The boat! Bate! The five divers moved toward the ships, swimming through the light chop. As he stroked along, Kaz was still shaking from the excitement of the shark encounter. He felt terrified and pumped up at the same time. He had spent years playing a sport at the very highest level, and yet nothing could have prepared him for the raw exhilaration of a life-and-death struggle. The world had never seemed so vividly alive. English pulled ahead, his flippers kicking up foam like a paddle wheel. He scrambled onto the dive platform, shed his gear with a single motion, and began hauling his charges out of the water, bellowing like a madman. Captain Vanover appeared on the deck above them. What happened? English turned blazing eyes on Kaz. Why do you do this idiot thing? You are maybe crazy. Fou, foo. Kaz gawked at him. I was protecting myself. That petite guppy wouldn't attack you. How could you know that? He was coming right at me. You move out of the way, alors, English roared. This is not rocket science. I'm sorry, okay, Kaz said defensively. I'm sorry I interrupted everybody. Let's go back and finish the dive. Oui, bien sûr, the guide agreed. A wonderful idea. After you, monsieur. Kaz frowned. What's the problem? But then he saw it, boiling up from the ocean where they had been diving only minutes before, churning white water around a mass of flailing fins, tails, and sleek bodies a feeding frenzy, dozens of sharks going after the carcass of the dead one, creating even more carnage with a barrage of snapping jaws. Blood in the water, kid, the captain said mildly. It's like ringing the, dinner it's like ringing the dinner bell. All of Kaz's heroic exhilaration morphed into a wave of queasiness. If it hadn't been for English, they would all be in the middle of that, being torn to pieces, thanks to Kaz's mistake. Now the guide turned to Vanova. I have not... I have not nine lives, me. Why do you send me down with babies? Except the girl, he indicated Star. She is good, but these three, pah! And he picked up his equipment, hopped onto the deck, and stormed below. The four teens remained rooted to the dive platform, unsure of what their next move should be. The captain couldn't help but notice their intimidation. Would it make you feel better if I told you he has a heart of gold? He's okay, Star conceded. That's because he said you're good, Dante accused. I am good, she retorted. The stocky man reached over and began helping them up to the deck. I could throttle those pinheads in Hollywood for getting the whole world so hung up on sharks. There's nothing on that reef for a diver to be afraid of. You run into a shark down there? Rest assured he's more scared of you than you are of him. Except maybe old Clarence. Four pairs of ears perked up. Clarence, Kaz echoed pulling off his diving flippers. Five or six years back, Vanova related, we had a rush of marlin. You couldn't put a foot in the water without stepping on a fin. The sharks came a few days later, 
tiger sharks, big. They shut this place down for two weeks. Nobody dove, nobody swam, nobody even fished. One pig-headed scientist took a sonar tow out, came back chicken wire. When the marlin moved on, the sharks followed. No one knows why Clarence didn't go with them. Maybe he was too old to keep up. You mean he's still here? Adriana asked timidly. Every few months or so, somebody spots him, the captain replied. He never hurts anyone. Still, you don't fool around with an 18-foot tiger shark. But these other reef rats around here, they're harmless. The teen divers gazed out over the water to where the feeding frenzy was in full swing. Oh, well, the noob were conceited. If we're going to put blood on the water, all bets are off. Sharks are only human, you know. Your dive knife isn't supposed to be a weapon. It's for cutting your way out of foul lines and hoses in an emergency. You use it as a last resort and don't ever pull it on a barracuda. All you'll see is a flash of silver, just like half the fish eats. He'll take a bite. Don't think he won't. Vanuver smiled at them benignly. Now, get out of those wetsuits before you roast. It was a very chastened dive team that sat in a row along the starboard gunwale as the Hernando Cortez carried them back to Cote San Luke Harbor. I knew all that stuff about sharks and barracudas, Star commented. I just didn't want to be a brown nose. Me neither, put in Kaz. That's why I got the furious Frenchman mad at me. He's scary, Adriana agreed fervently. Given a choice between him and, him and the sharks, I'll take my chances with the sharks. Not me, Dante said feelingly. Did you catch that story about the tiger shark? They attack humans, don't they? The star snorted. There's a lot of nasty stuff in the ocean. But if you let it spook you, it's like never leaving the house because you never know when a bear is going to wander out of the woods. People dive their whole lives with no problem. So there's a tiger shark somewhere. Big deal. The ocean's full of animals. That's why we take the plunge. Kaz's eyes fell on an odd piece of equipment mounted on the bulkhead at the base of the Cortez's flying bridge, behind a stack of orange life vests. It looked like a baby's crib that had been taken apart, only the slatted panels were larger and made of titanium. He had noticed it before and reflected that the thing kind of looked familiar. Now he recognized it, an anti-shark cage, complete with ballast tanks and control panel. If sharks are so harmless, why do they need an anti-shark cage? Dante interrupted his reverie. Speaking of animals, Kaz followed his pointing finger to a large metal bucket sitting just astern of the cockpit. It was filled to the brim with water that kept spilling out with the movement of the boat. They watched, fascinated, as a slate-gray tentacle matched the galvanized metal of the pail probed tentatively over the rim. A moment later, the octopus hoisted itself up to the edge of the bucket and dropped to the deck. Immediately, it began a quick, amoeba-like oozing motion toward the nearest exit. When it spied the four teenagers, it froze for a moment, eyes fixed on them as it Spotty assumed the olive drab color of the planks. Go for it, dude, whispered Dante. He's going to cook you. The octopus apparently took that advice to heart. It slithered to the gunwale and promptly disappeared over the side. As they were unloading equipment on the dock at Cote Tay, St. Luke Harbor, Manasque Girard has his, had his first look into the empty bucket that had once held his dinner. His frown was a thunderhead. Adriana read his mind and saw accusation in it. I swear we didn't do it, Mr. English. He climbed out, ran across the deck, and jumped in the ocean. Honest. But once again, the dive guard had retreated into a series of grunts. Grunts of suspicion. Seventeenth of April, sixteen sixty five. At thirteen years old, Samuel Higgins remembered his mother, but the mental image was fading. He'd only been six, after all, when Sewell's men had come for him, small enough to be carried off, kicking and howling in a burlap sack. It was a kidnapping, to be sure, but no constable or sheriff ever came to far-off Liverpool to search for him. What reward might there have been? Samuel's family had nothing, and now six-year-old Samuel had no family. He would not have been hard to find if anyone had been looking. Sewell, the chimney sweep, had many climbing boys working for him, all undersized and underfed, abandoned or kidnapped. Samuel, it turned out, excelled at the dirty work. He could scamper up a chimney as easily as walking down the cobblestone alleyways of the port city. And unlike the boys who worked alongside him, 
He did not grow long of limb or broad of shoulder as he reached his adolescence. Don't worry, lad, laughed Miss, old Mr. Sewell over and over. I've seen a hundred like you. You'll be dead of a fall long before you're too big to climb one of those chimneys. The man was as sharp as he was heartless, but he turned out to be wrong about that. Samuel never succumbed to the terrible accidents that extinguished the short, unhappy lives of the other boys. And the day did finally come when young Samuel Higgins could no longer fit into the narrow, sooty tunnels where he'd earned his keep since he was only six. Sorry, lad, Mr. Sewell had told him. If you do no work, I can't be keeping and feeding you. It had not been a loving family, but at least he'd belonged. Now he was being driven out. Would the world ever find a place for Samuel Higgins? Sewell had been hard, but hunger, Samuel's new master, was even harder. At first, he considered a return to the countryside and his mother, but he was not certain where he might find her, or if she was even alive. This life with Sewell was the only life he remembered, and now that was over. His heart yearned for his lost family, but his empty belly was in charge. There was no future in England for a penniless boy, except starvation and death. His only hope, his one chance, lay with the sea. He signed on with the griffin for a plate of stew and a promise of future wages. Not a princely contract, to be sure. But considering that his former employment had come as the result of a kidnapping, this represented freedom and he was much satisfied. He had no inkling at that time of the true purpose of the griffin and its fleet, nor what its business was in the vast ocean that stretched westward to a new world. He only knew that there was food in the galley for him to eat, and a small rectangle of deck planking outside the captain's quarters where he could sleep. Home. As the captain's boy Samuel was the personal manservant to Captain Jam James Blade, his duties included everything from delivering the captain's meals to cleaning and brushing his uniform and wigs, delivering messages to crew members, and emptying the man's chamber pot. To Captain Blade, Samuel was less than human, a utensil, like a spoon or a shaving razor. Boy, he would bark when he needed something, or often he'd shout, You! The one time that Samuel had the audacity to venture, My name is Samuel, sir. The captain pulled out a furled snake whip from his belt and smacked him across the side of the head with the bone handle. You can ride on this ship or in the waves below. Take your choice, boy, but you'll not open your lip to me. The blow knocked Samuel clear through the hatch to the captain's quarters, sending a laden tray of food flying every which way. And swab this deck. There was an emerald the size of a musket ball set in the handle. It left a deep, bloody gash in Samuel's cheek. The wound did not stop oozing until they had passed the Canary Islands. <laughs>